absolutely delighted to be here. First of all, it's wonderful to meet you. It's great to be on this campus, which I've never had a chance to visit before. But I'm just happy to be here. Five weeks ago, I was um, hiking in the White Mountains with six people from my group. Well, five people from my group, six including me. And um, I've done a lot of mountaineering. I've climbed to the show, ski down long, climbed lots of good peaks. But the White Mountains tend to be uh, an obstacle that I've got easy to conquer. I got trapped overnight. We all got trapped overnight. And uh, what can I say? We barely made it out. And, uh, and um, I got frostbite on both of my feet, which is why I'm limping a little bit. Uh, but luckily, that's the only injury I sustained. Um, so, I'm just happy to be alive. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm supposed to confess here. I could give you a great story about perseverance and survival, but I'm, I've been invited here to talk about education. And I'm going to do that as the title says in the form of a confession. Now, looking around here, I'm kind of intimidated. You know, I, I, I you know, confessing is something you want to do one on one, not in front of so many people. I guess I just have to uh, remind myself of the American proverb the more you confess, the more books you will sell. <laughs> anyway, let's start with the first confession. When I started teaching at Harvard University, 30 years ago, um, I never asked myself the question, how am I going to teach? Which is kind of strange, right? Because when you do something new in your career, that should be the first question you ask yourself. But it was really obvious what I was going to do in the class. I was going to do to my students what my professors had done to me. I think we all tend to do that. We tend to project our own experiences into the world around us. And I naively, because it really turned out to be a very naive belief, naively believed that I had learned physics by sitting a, in an amphitheater listening to my uh, professors. So I started lecturing. In fact, I have to tell you, I was asked to teach the course, as an assistant professor, I was asked to teach a course that none of my colleagues wanted to teach. Physics for pre-medical students. <laughs> well, these were not students who wanted to go to physics. No, they had to take physics, and, and they already hated physics before they stepped into the classroom. But something interesting happened. I got very high teaching evaluations. So clearly the students liked what I was doing in front of the classroom. And you know what happens when you get high teaching evaluations. You get punished to ask you to teach the course again. <laughs> But that was not the only indicator. The other, other feedback that I received was also telling me, Eric, you're doing a good job. The other feedback was my students' performance on examinations. Typically, when physics is taught to pre-medical students, it's an algebra-based course, not a calculus-based course. So in my class, full-grown calculus-based course, I gave these students exam problems I wasn't sure I would do well on under the pressure of an exam. But they did well. So in short, they liked me as a teacher. They did well on what I considered complicated exam. Obviously, I was doing the right thing. And very quickly, I started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. <laughs> now, in retrospect, there were always some negative signs. But I ignore them. You see, I'm a positive thinker, so if you get positive signs and negative signs, I ignore the negative ones and focus on the positive ones. Let me give you some examples. Every year, in spite of giving me high evaluations on my questionnaire, some students would write at the bottom of their evaluation questionnaire, this was not before it was done on the web, they would write, physics is boring, or physics sucks. <laughs> It never make any sense of that. I mean, what is, what is more interesting than understanding how the universe and how things So I, I, basically, uh, I basically ignored um, these remarks. You know, the same thing happens when I go to a party and people ask me what I do for a living. 
And I tell him I'm a physicist. And I get these worries. Oh, physics? <laughs> I got such a hard time with physics in college or in high school. Well, my dentist recently told me, you know, I couldn't even talk back because of the thing in my mouth. <laughs> I said, ah, oh, you're a physicist. I got an A for physics in college, but I really didn't understand anything. <laughs> It always creates this feeling of embarrassment. And then I, I couldn't understand why there was this frustration with physics education. I'm sure if you're a chemist or a mathematician, you probably translate this to your own uh, disciplines. So I continued happily doing what I did for many, many years before discovering eventually that it was all a house of cards, which is basically what it's called. It's about. Now, you all have a little device on your table, a clicker. There's a big danger in starting a talk about education with Facebook, about education with technology. I love technology. You can find all the latest gadgets in my pockets. However, I think that technology has done very, very, very little to improve education. And the reason is that most application technologies are simply old wine new bottles. I mean, why would projecting slides be any better than writing on the blackboard? Or why would, you know, videotaping a lecture and putting it online, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, be any better than a live lecture? Um, so I think it's maybe not that surprising that most uses of technology in um, education have not really done much to change the quality of education. They're simply you know, doing something that we already did in a new way. We should really think about the pedagogy. That is what it is. And this talk is really not about technology at all. Everything we're doing right now, we can do in this talk this morning, we could do without the clicker. I'll initially, I'll use it just as a polling tool. At the end, I'll use it as an engagement tool. And uh, if you get excited about this approach to teaching and you think, oh, no, I need clickers. No, you don't. You can do it without clickers. In fact, I started this approach to teaching called pre-instruction without any technology. There were no clickers. The clickers were invented later in order to support this pedagogy. So I want to emphasize right here off the bat, it's not about the technology. It is about the pedagogy. Now before we get to the pedagogy, I want to start with a little exercise. I want to make you reflect on your own education. I'm going to ask you a question which is very personal. You have a nice little pad and a pen in front of you. So I want you to answer that question on the little pad. And because it's very personal, I'll write it in no way that your neighbor can't see what you wrote down. And as soon as you bring it down, you can hide it. But I do want that commitment of writing something down. And it's a hard question. Here's the question. Think of something you are good at. Something you know you do well something you're proud of, something other people respect you for. It could be, I'm just going to say something, solving partial differential equations. It could be interpreting medieval works of art. It could be public speaking. It could be baking cakes. It could be managing teams, whatever. Something you know you're good at. And ideally, I want you to select something that has been important in your career. So unless you're a baker, a baking case, so you'll probably not get in there. So go ahead. You're all successful individuals, so it shouldn't take long to come up with something. Hmm, I'm surprised. You know, usually when I do this in an academic environment, within a few seconds, there's somebody who raises his or her hand and says, only one thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pick one thing. Okay, is that ready? So you can hide this, and you won't need to reveal it to anyone. So, does anybody need more time? Good. Okay, so now that you've committed to that, I'm going to ask a follow-up question which refers back to the answer you wrote. And this is a harder question, much harder question. How did you become, oops, pardon me. Oh, you know what, before we do that, I have to tell you how the clickers work. I forgot about that. Sorry, sorry. My, uh, Maybe I'm not awake instead of... Okay, so the clicker is very simple. There's no on-off button. Here's mine. And only the last click counts. So I'm going to take a, a survey 
for the second question, you press one, two, three, four, five, and if you press one button and then think, oh no, I pressed the wrong button, you can press again. It's not that you get to vote twice. The second one overrides the first one. Uh, and the display will show the recorded answer. The only button you should stay away from is the channel button that permits you to change the frequency at which it transmits because you, know, you, you don't want people in the neighboring classroom to be able to vote in this classroom, so you can set them on different channels. Turn the clicker around for just a moment and notice that uh, on the back there is this unique ID number. Each clicker has a unique ID number and whenever you press a button, it sends not only that button, it also sends the ID number. So you think you might sit here anonymously. I'm sorry. <laughs> we placed them very carefully on the table, recording every... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let me show you what, my, um, what, what it looks from my end. I have this little window here that uh, floats in front of my presentation software. And as you can see, there's the number 24 there. That, that means that 24 people have been playing with their clickers. <laughs> 28, 29, very good, very good. So go ahead, why don't you all start playing? And you can see that this number will increase. At any point, I can hit this button here and I see the distribution of clicks. So button one and button five are very popular. Why don't you all press button one now? Go ahead, press button one. I love it when audiences follow my instruction. <laughs> and notice that instantly the distribution changes. If I hit the stop button, it freezes <coughs> the distribution. Now if you, <coughs> pardon me, if you press a button, you don't see in the little display the number and the letter corresponding to the button. You see a circle with a line, meaning, you know, forming is closed. It's over. That's all there really is to it. There's maybe one more thing. When I hit this pause button, or the stop button, it records this graph, and it also takes a picture of whatever is in the background. Which means that when I review the data, I know that this distribution went with this screen, there's no question on the screen, but you know, I remember it. that's when we were playing with the clickers. Um, that's great because I don't need to program questions. I can use any type of presentation software, or not even present, I could use Word or the web or whatever, and, and it would get stored together with uh, the data. Okay, enough about technology. So this was the question I asked you, and now we get to the follow-up question. How did you become good at whatever it, it is? that you wrote down? Where did you learn it? What were the circumstances that led you to develop that, that skill or that knowledge? You know, when I asked the first question, everybody started writing right away. And now everybody's turned. <laughs> and the reason this question is hard to answer is because, you know, when we're good at something, we take ownership of it. It's fun. Right? I mean, you become unaware of the learning process. So I want you to dig back into your memories of the past and write down in one or two words the circumstances that led you or what it is that you did in order to become good and whatever it is that you wrote down. I'll give you a few seconds to formulate your thoughts. Incidentally, I have done this uh, little exercise all over the globe, from the southernmost tip of Chile and Patagonia to Colombia to and the northernmost most have gone is probably Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, on this continent. I've done it all over Europe. I've done it uh, in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, I've done it in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, <coughs> South Africa. I've done it all over Asia, from, from Thailand to Malaysia to China. Japan, and there's something really interesting about the answers to this second question. Namely, there is no cultural difference. In other words, if you ask people in Chile, and you ask people in China, you get <coughs> essentially the same answers. In other words, culture doesn't seem to affect how we learn, which is maybe not that surprising. After all, we're all wired to learn. Yes, there are cultural differences between the people in China and Chile, but in the way they report learning, there's no difference. Now, admittedly, I've never done this in Stony Brook, and you just heard <laughs> this is such an exceptional place. So I'm very much looking forward to the data. But you've got IRP approval for this study. 
You're anonymous anyway. So. <laughs> Does anybody need more time? No? Okay, so I've collected the answers to the second question, and uh, they tend to fall in uh, the following five categories. I became good at it. Wow, some people are already pressing their clickers. We became good at it through trial and error, by trying something, you know, making mistakes, learning from my mistakes. I became good at it by listening to lectures. The word listening, by the way, is not on there, but I, I want to make that distinction because as we professors all know, there's no better way to learn something than giving lectures. So I, I don't want number two to be interpreted as giving lectures, it's listening. Three, I became good at it by practicing. Four, I became good at it through apprenticeship, by tagging along with somebody who's really, really good at it, working on that person's shoulder, learning from that person. Mm -hmm. And then five is, you know, a catch-all category, everything that, that's left, friends, family, you name it. Please select what you, what comes closest to what you wrote down, and then let's see. <laughs> The faculty of Stony Brook is any different from the rest of the world. I'm going to give you 10 more seconds to make up your mind and select a choice between 1 and 5. Okay. Got 110 here. Okay, so let's see. Five more seconds. Three, two, one, and zero. Here we go. And no, I don't know what answer J is, but maybe somebody held the clicker upside down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can relax. You're right there with the rest of the world. Between, typically between 40 and 70% or so report that they became good at whatever it is by practicing. We learn by doing. So you can relax. You're no different from the rest of planet Earth. But you know, that's not why I did this little exercise. There's something else really interesting about that distribution there behind me. What is it? What is it? Apart from J, which will be the lowest one. What is it? Hmm? The lowest one B. The lowest one B. Lectures. Only something like seven poor souls here. <laughs> said that they became good at it by whatever it is that they wrote down, by listening to lectures. And you know, how do we teach? Here's how we teach. So we see right off the bat that there's something, this is actually a picture of me teaching my pre-med course. It's a very old picture. It was taken B.C. Before computers. You see, I'm using, I'm using the overhead projector. Anyway, we see right off the bat here something really interesting. You just admitted that something that was important in your career, you learned by practicing, by doing, yet we teach by lecture. So here's what I'd like to do, the, the outline of my talk is here at the bottom. I'd like to start by talking a little about education. What is education exactly? We're educators. We're an institution of higher education here. We ought to know what we mean by the term education. Yet, if I were to ask you to write down a concise definition of the word education, I think many of us, including myself, would probably be struggling. I mean, it's one of these concepts where you know what you mean when you use the word, but it's very hard to articulate what it actually is that we want to accomplish. Well, we're educators, so we better, we better agree on what we mean. That Education is. So, the first part of my talk, I'd like to revisit that <coughs> concept and think a little bit about education. Then, I'd like to talk about pre-instruction, which is an approach to teaching that I developed after <coughs> discovering that my students weren't really learning anything at all uh, in my course. And um, I thought, given that we're in an academic institution, I uh, better end with a uh, test. So, you better pay attention, and that will come at the end. <laughs> so, let's start with education. And let's ask ourselves the following question. Let's go back to that picture that I showed. What is it exactly that is happening there? Take that picture of me lecturing in front of my 
three men students. I want you, you have to just blurt it out, to describe in one or two words, one of which is a verb, I believe, what it is that is happening on the screen behind me. And the two verbs I do not want to hear are teaching and learning. So you have to say other things. So go ahead, just throw it out. Listening. Reading. 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 Napping. Napping. <laughs> did, did I tell you that these are my students? <laughs> but you know, now that you mention it, the French writer Albert Camus once wrote, some people talk in their sleep. <laughs> Lecturers talk while other people are sleeping. <laughs> you know, I'm going to show you some data at the end of my talk from MIT that show, you're laughing about this, but that show that this is actually much closer to the truth than, than you could believe. Really exciting data, I'll show you that. But anyway, these are my students. They're not sleeping. So we are sleeping, listening, or napping, uh, reading. Let's hear some more. Writing, writing, writing taking notes. Thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Texting. This was BC. <laughs> there was no texting. No so wait. Most of the verbs we've heard deal either with me as the instructor, reading, uh, talking, or with the students, napping, writing, and so on. So. We're both there at the same time. Is there a way to sort of capture the two at the same time? What is it that is happening there between the two of us, rather than one or the other? Sharing or information? Sharing information. But wait, sharing to me means I give you something, you give me something back. I don't think there's much sharing going on. We're copying. Copying. The sharing comes close to what I'm really after. Experiencing. 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 Well, maybe. I would say lectures focus on the transmission of information. Maybe you meant sharing in that in that sense. Uh, I'm sorry, who was it who said sharing there? Yeah, maybe that's what you had actually in mind. Well, I, I look for the blank look too, so then I ask them. So hopefully there's a little Coming back. dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my students had actually pointed it out. I had rubbed it in my face very early in my teaching career that I was doing exactly that, what, what is shown on the screen here. You see, I told you a minute ago that when I started teaching, I did not ask myself, how am I going to teach? What was the question that did come up in my mind, do you think? What, exactly, not the how, but the what. So I went to a colleague who had taught the, book, taught the course before, and he said to me, oh, for the past 10 years in this course, we have used Halliday and Resnick. And he also told me that in the US, I've just come from Europe, in the US, students buy the textbook for the introduction courses. In Europe, we'd never get that into our brains. I mean, why would you buy a textbook and the professors are sending the content of the textbook to you? But so, you know, he told me that I had to make sure that there were enough books in store in stock. So I went to the bookstore on campus. And uh, I said, be sure that by September 15th, you have 150 copies of Halliday and Resnick in stock. And as I walked back to my office, I thought, wait a minute. If the students have that book, and I have the same book, then what do I do in the class? <laughs> so I knocked on uh, my colleague's door, and I asked him that question. And he said, oh, don't worry. There are lots of different physics textbooks. And he showed me a shelf full of textbooks. And I started looking, and very quickly, I found the perfect book. <coughs> it was perfect for two reasons. One, it had a different approach from Helen Resnick, so at least I was not simply regurgitating the content of the book that they had bought. But that was not the important reason. The second reason, the important one was the book was out of print. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get their hands on, on a copy. So for every class, I spend countless hours preparing my lecture notes, which in class I would either project on the overhead projector, as you can see here, or I'd write them on the board uh, at the back of the class. And because my notes were different from the textbook, I decided to hand out 
copies of my notes. This was before the internet, so it was not a matter of posting them. I decided to hand out a copy of my notes to my students. So as they walked out of the classroom at the end of the class, in the back, they could pick up a copy of the notes. Now, why do you think that I hand them out at the end of class, right in the beginning of the class? So they would stay and, and listen to me. But is that a real thing that there's a problem? <laughs> I mean, why force them to get the information out of my mouth if they could get it by reading my notes? That never came up in my mind. But you know what did happen? What happened was that at the end of that year, about half a dozen students wrote in the comment section of their end of semester feedback form. They wrote, Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I mean, what was I supposed to do? Then I've got another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I handed out to them? I was livid. <laughs> These ungrateful students. <laughs> But you know, they had a point. It was lecture for my lecture notes. And if they had looked at the book, they would have seen that the book wasn't that different from my notes. Now, this practice is so common, right? It's all around the world. I, I make a habit when I visit another campus from time to time to drop in on classes and see what the teaching practices are. And I can tell you, from you know, from Peru to uh, Malaysia to Egypt to Europe to everywhere in the US, you see the same picture. If you were an extraterrestrial visiting Earth and studying our, our teaching practices, you could well decide that education is lecturing. So I want to actually put the question to you. Is that what education is? Is, is education simply the transfer of information. Is that what it is? I don't have a slide for that, but why don't we do it? Why don't we use the trickers for that? So if you believe that education is just the transfer of information, press 1. If you think education is more than just the transfer of information, press 2. And let's see where we stand on this issue. Okay, five more seconds. We got a few more clicks this time, 121. Good. So let's see where we stand. Oh, pardon me. I didn't want to hide this. See? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll ignore the C. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to say that, you know, we're quite unanimous here. 5%, probably those are the same people who said, uh, who chose lecture for, you know, that other question that I asked. Um, five poor souls here, or maybe six, chose yes. I have a warning for you. You're about to lose your job. Just let's, let's be pragmatic here. Let's imagine for a moment that education is indeed a transfer of information. What would be the pragmatic thing to do if education were just to transfer information in the 21st century? What would be the pragmatic thing to do? Automated. Automated. Put it online, right? You could take the best possible physics professor in English, in Chinese, in, in Arabic, in French, in whatever, Spanish. Put it online. Do the same thing for the other disciplines. What would you lose? What would you lose by doing that? Other than our jobs, of course, right? <laughs> what would you lose? Interaction. interaction. But how much interaction is there really? I mean, I'm working really hard on interacting with you, and we have the benefit of sitting here in an amphitheater. But you know, I make a, a habit of observing classes. Also, my campus, I'll go to a psychology class or, or you know, a chemistry <coughs> class. It's, it's very interesting to see how other disciplines are taught. And, you know, psychology, we have great psychologists at Harvard, for example, Stephen Pinker was a fantastic lecturer. So I'll sit in the back and observe, I get these brilliant lectures, you know, and then for 10 minutes he talks and then he stops and he says, does anybody have a question? Anybody? <laughs> a 
and you know how the students are, they look down. <laughs> and if the instructor waits long enough, it's always the same person in the front row <laughs> who reluctantly raises his or her hand. So I think that, you know, in, in a lecture, there's very little interaction. You, you could be easily fooled into believing that there's a lot, but 99.9% .9 of the students do not interact. And in fact, that's a problem with this architecture. To whom do we owe this architecture? The Greek, exactly. Now, the Greek invented the amphitheater over 2,000 years ago. And the amphitheater was developed for teaching or not? No, it was developed for plays and for concerts, music, for performances. It was a performance space, not a learning space. The two reasons for this architecture are so that everybody can see the performers and everybody can hear the performers. That's why the amphitheater was developed by the ancient Greek. Did the ancient Greek use the amphitheater as a learning space? No. If you look at a, uh, if you look at a uh, representation of the School of Athens, for example, as a famous um, uh, painting by Raphael, you don't see people sit in neat rows. No. Oh, they walk around and they talk and they discuss. So the Greek was smart enough not to use the amphitheater as a learning space. Because what happens? If you sit down in an amphitheater like that, you automatically are turned into a passive observer. Right? You sit down, you don't expect to participate. You expect to observe, and take in, like you would do in a performance such as theater or a, uh, a concert. But somewhere in the Middle Ages, you know, we adopted this, uh, this uh, architecture. And I think that's when things really started to derail. So I think you'd lose very little interaction. So, you know, I, 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 besides our job, we lose very, very little. But actually, we would create something we would make something possible that wasn't possible before because we actually create the opportunity to think. You see, in a lecture, your mind, we'll get back to that at the end, but your mind, in a sense, is held captive by the presenter. There's no time to think. Because if you think, your mind wanders, you can no longer listen to the information that's coming in. We are our brains are not wired to multitask. We cannot listen and think at the same time. So the only thing you can do is process the, thing, process the information cognitively at a very shallow level. Maybe write it down so you can think about it later. Hmm. Have you ever had a student in one of your classes raise his or her hand and say, Professor, could you please be quiet for 10 minutes? I need to think. <laughs> it never happened to me. But you know, online, you could easily do that. You pause and you think, hmm, I'm going to think about this. Or if you take a book, right? if you take a book, you regulate how, at what rate the information goes into you. If you need to think and pause, you stop reading, and then you pick up again and you're ready to read. So at least, if it's online, you could regulate the rate at which the information comes in. Have you ever had a student in your classes raise her hand and say, Professor, could you please repeat the last half hour? I need to hear it again. I mean, maybe okay for the student has, but the whole half hour, I don't think that we'd ever do that. Online, it's easy, right? You've got to listen to it again. You can listen to it again. With a book. So I think if education is just the transfer of information. I'm talking still about these six people here. We are in trouble. We're going to lose our jobs because other vehicles for transferring information are better suited to the way the human brain works. Luckily, most of us are not worried about that because we know that education is more than just the transfer of information. So I picked it up on those six people, so let's now turn to the 94% here. <coughs> so you've got to tell me now, what more is it? If education is not just the transfer of information, what more is it? 
Inter yes. Interaction. Interaction. Experience. Experience. Practice. 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 Thank you so much. We did that, ex that, that, that little exercise specifically for that. But you need to do something with that information. It's not good enough just to open your skull, put the information in, close your skull. Although, if you stop to think about it, so much of education is simply instructors transferring information to the students. Then you wait a few weeks or a month. You isolate the students from any source of information from each other, a situation they're going to encounter daily in their future lives. <laughs> that was a cynical remark. Uh, and then they regurgitate it back to you. You know, I, I was educated in Europe, and people in Europe tend to pride themselves on the quality of secondary education. If I stop to think about it, it was all really a house of cards, too. I mean, take history, for example. I grew up in Holland, so there's a lot of focus on Dutch history. And at some point in my history lessons, I learned that in 1660, the, uh, I forgot, I'm sorry, some, some year, the Dutch defeated the British in the River Thames, just outside London. So some other navy managed to get up the River Thames and defeat the British Navy on their home turf. And then on the exam, a few weeks later, in what year did the Dutch defeat the British in the River Thames? I, I wasn't given the right answer because I, I did recently well in history, but first of all, I've forgotten what year it was. And did temporarily remembering that year make me a better citizen? I have no clue why the Dutch even were fighting the British, <laughs> or how they managed to sail up the, the things and then defeat them right on their own turf. You know, laughing about it, but I think there's a, there's a lot of truth in that. In fact, I think it was Einstein who once said, education is what is left after all that is learned is forgotten. <laughs> if you're laughing, it's actually a very sad statement, I think, you know. Although, it is a sad truth, too. In fact, I think I have forgotten most of what I have learned and what I need now. In fact, I'm doing nanophotonics now, and the field of nanophotonics did not even exist when I was in graduate school. So most of the things that I need now for my disciplinary research, I do learn it afterwards. I think that you know the true homework of learning is if you can take what you've learned, the knowledge in a sense embedded in the information, and apply that to a new context. You know, not that long ago, I was giving a talk in um, in Connecticut, at the University of Connecticut. I won't name any names. They're a very good university, but, uh, <laughs> and I was doing it in the physics department, and uh, after my talk one of the faculty members came to me and said, I've had something really strange happen in my course this year. Really, what was it? He said, well, you know, I wanted to make, he, he taught physics for engineering school. He wanted to make physics relevant for the students. <laughs> and in order to make it relevant, he, he wanted to put it in a real world context. So he put it in the context of baseball. I mean, there's a lot of physics and baseball, right? Trajectories of balls, collisions between balls and bats, runners running, you name it. So in class, he would use examples from baseball. On the homework, he put baseball problems. On the midterm examination, he put baseball problems. <coughs> At the end of the semester, he was preparing the final exam, and he realized he'd run out of baseball problems. So they put some football problems in the exam. <laughs> Professor complained to students, we have never done any football problems. <laughs> You're laughing about it. We should be crying. <laughs> Maybe you recognize some of your own students or even your own discomfort when you were examining in a context that you had not encountered before. But stop to think about it. Our students are going to face problems that are very different from the ones we treat now. We have to prepare them for a world that is going to be different from what it is today. We have to teach them the skills for jobs that don't even have names right now. I mean, I know when I was a student, the word internet did not exist. The word web programmer we have had no meaning whatsoever. And I can think of a whole long list of jobs like that. 
So I think unless you can take what you've learned and apply it in a new context, you have not really learned. Today I will only talk about the pedagogy and how the pedagogy makes it difficult. But I think the other piece of the puzzle is the assessment. I have another talk, which you can watch on YouTube, and put on YouTube called Assessment, a Silent Killer of Learning. Because I really do think that we not only need to think about the way we teach, but also the way we assess. Because in a sense, the assessment reinforces the way that students study and learn. All right, so I'd love to talk about more about that, but I'm going to talk only about the in-class component. Anyway, so what is the result of this focus on information transfer? It, it, it took a long time for me to discover that my students were actually not learning very much. Here's what happened. After about seven years, I, wrote, I, I read a series of articles that described a test, a word-based test called the Force Concept Inventory, which tests students' understanding of Newton's laws, of the concept of force, just by using word-based questions. So no equations, nothing, just words. Now, force is a very fundamental concept in physics. It's dealt with in you know, the first week or two. In fact, in my class at Harvard, because all students have had AP physics, I glossed over the concept completely. I assumed you know, students already knew it. So we started to deal with things like momentum, energy, work, which all depend on the concept of force. It's like a fundamental you know, building block of, of knowledge in, in physics. Well, I read in this article that it doesn't make much difference whether you ask these questions at the beginning of the semester or the end of the semester. The students do equally poorly on both. I thought, no way, not my students. <laughs> you know, I, I have to admit, I mean, most of the, the data there were collected in Arizona, California, New Mexico. So I thought, you know, maybe there's some kind of a disease raging there, <laughs> raging there on the, on the, in the southwest. Sure, here in the northeast, things are much, much better. But you know, I'm a scientist, so one of the things I've learned is that you don't just make statements like that. So I thought, I'm going to show that in my class, students do significantly better. Unfortunately, it was too late to do a pretest. We were already in the middle of the semester. So I thought, you know, I'm going to show how my students mm -hmm. ace this test. So one day I walked into class and I said to my students, look, I'm going to give you a quiz. You, you, you know, I mean, I, I, you know how pre-meds are, right? You use the word test and they, they freak out. So I <laughs> and then I said, you know, you don't have to worry about this quiz. It's not going to affect your final grade in any way. I'm just giving it to you so as to assess the effectiveness of my teaching. And as I said that, I realized that I'd just taken away an incentive for them to even participate. Right? You know how pre-meds are, right? It's not factoring to the grades, they won't take it. But I better, I better give them a reason to take this seriously. So I said, look, in, uh, in a week, we have a midterm exam coming up. This is a great opportunity to test your knowledge and see if there are things that you need to review. As soon as I said that, I realized it pulled up a huge lie. I mean, <laughs> the midterm examination was dealing with rotational motion. They had to calculate triple integrals. I mean, it was so way beyond the concept of force that it wasn't even funny anymore. So I started to worry that the students would be offended as soon as they would see the simplicity of this quiz. Oh boy, were my worries quickly dispelled because hardly had they started taking this test. Or one student raised their hand. I walked up to her, and she asked, Professor Mazur, how should I answer these questions? <laughs> according to what you taught me, or according to the way I usually think about these things? <laughs> I have no clue how to answer that question. <laughs> and by the time the test had been completed, I had been dragged out of my ivory tower. <laughs> well, Harvard students did a little bit better than the students in the Southwest. Quite a few of them scored lower than a gorilla pressing random <laughs> because they consistently chose the wrong answer. 
So some harvesters belong in the private sector. <laughs> anyway, so you know, not only do we have lack of learning, as we know, we already mentioned this, lack of retention, right? Most of what is learned is forgotten. What good is it then? Are we teaching the skills we really need to teach? Anyway, so when I did that test, that was, uh, that was uh, a big shock. My first reaction was, Eric, maybe you should be teaching radio courses. <laughs> but you know, I wasn't willing to give up that easily. And it turns out that the solution presented itself serendipitously. But what this told me was, it's not the transfer of the information that's important, it's the assimilation, the making sense of the information. The aha moment, oh, I get it. Where did that happen for you? I've often asked myself that question. Where did the aha moment, the I get it, occur? Did it happen while I was sitting in a classroom that's very different from the one I had on the screen a moment ago, listening to a professor. Did it happen for you while you were sitting in an amphitheater class listening to a professor? I see many people shake. No, no. It probably happened outside of the classroom when we were on our own. And we became professors. Most of our students will not become professors. Is it reasonable to assume that it will happen to them outside the classroom as well? Probably not. So I tend to see education now as a two-step process. The first step is the transfer of information, because I think we all agree if you don't have transfer of information, you don't have any education. But that's not sufficient. The students need to assimilate that information. Pierre Shem would probably have called it accommodating information, but now I use the word assimilate. You're sort of making sense, build the mental models that allow you to apply what you've learned into a new context which I think we all agree is the true hallmark of learning. Now, in the standard approach to teaching, all of the emphasis is on one in class, at least in a lecture class, whereas the assimilation to the students is left to the students on his or her own outside of the classroom. Shouldn't we really focus on the second step and use this precious time that we have to the students to address this much harder second step, because I guess we would all agree it's the second step that is the hard one, not the first one, definitely not in the 21st century. So back in 1991, which is when I started doing the instruction, I decided, you know, we should really invert the sequence here. There's a great term for that now, flipped classroom, although I think the emphasis is then on one, not on two still. So rather than doing one in class and two out of class, let's do one out of class so that we can do two in class. There's a lot of discussion about how, in fact, in fact the whole flipped class movement mostly focuses on the out of class before and still the information transfer. To me, that's a trivial part of education. We can talk about it in discussion if you want later, but that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the question, if you have transferred the information before class, then what do you do in the class? And the answer to that question, again, is absolutely <coughs> nothing new. It's teach by questioning rather than by telling. Who said that first? Socrates, over 2,000 years ago. And here we are in the 21st century, and we're still mainly teaching by time. Incidentally, this was a completely accidental discovery. I just told you that I was afraid that my students would be offended by this FCI. They weren't offended at all. They were horrified when they saw how poorly they did. So they asked me to arrange a session at night to go over every of the 30 questions on that FCI. So I booked one of our large classrooms, 250 students came, and we went through every single question on that FCI. And I remember at one point I got to a question that in my mind was totally trivial. Here's the question. A heavy truck and a light car collide head-on on the highway. Is the force exerted by the heavy truck on the light car, A, larger than that of the light car on the heavy truck? B, they're equal to each other? C, the light car exerts a larger force on the heavy truck than the other way around? D, they're not exerting any force in each other. They're, they're just in each other's way. 
<laughs> You're laughing about that. I think no physicist could ever come up with such a crazy answer. But you know, the way the FCI was developed was by giving these questions as open-ended questions, harvesting answers from hundreds of students, and then tabulating the most frequent incorrect responses. And this was one of them, believe it. See, the multiple choice tests are, are usually hard because when, when you write a multiple choice question, you can easily come up as the expert with the right answer, but it's very hard to come up with plausible incorrect answer. You actually have to do research in order to know what the students would answer because as the expert, you suffer from what my colleague Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. <coughs> you can no longer think like a beginning learner. Anyway, all the students in introductory physics know Newton's third law. They can recite it. You may have heard of it. Action is reaction. Or the force of object one on object two is equal in magnitude to the force of object two on object one. In equation form, it would be F for force, subscript one, two, is equal to F two, one. Now, something really interesting happens when you replace one by heavy truck and two are like cars. <laughs> they forget all about Newton's third law. So anyway, so when I had to explain that question, I drew a diagram of the, of the truck on one side of the board, the, the, the car on the other. I drew the force of gravity, the forces of the road up that holds the car up, and then the force of the truck on the car and the car on the truck. And I said, by Newton's third law, these two forces are equal to each other. <coughs> more is that you talk about, right? I turned around and I could at once see that you know, they were confused. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused they could not articulate the question. <laughs> you know how it is, right? When you're really confused, it's hard. So I thought, this is serious. You know? So I erased the board. I thought, let me try it again. And maybe they're confused by the fact that the forces are the same, but the effects are very different accelerations because the masses are different. So let me bring in Newton's second law. So I erased the board, started over again, and in the next eight minutes, I managed to produce the most brilliant explanation. It was, it was, just, it was fantastic. You know, I worked out everything with equations, uh, Newton's second law, Newton's first law, the accelerations, the inertia, everything. It was, it was brilliant. Anyway, after eight minutes, I, I, I turned around. You know, my jacket was covered in chalk dust. <laughs> Only to see that they, they look even more. <laughs> and they could still not articulate any any coherent question. I didn't, I didn't know what to do anymore. I mean, I had I'd done everything I could, right? I knew one thing, however. I knew that half of them had given the right answer on the quiz. So in a moment of despair, I said, why don't you discuss it with each other? And something happened I had never seen in my classroom. Complete chaos erupted. <laughs> they forgot about me in front of the classroom. I, I could have walked away. They, they wouldn't have noticed it. What's more, in just two minutes, they figured it out. At first I thought, how can that be? Ah, the expert <laughs> spent 10 minutes explaining it unsuccessfully. And in two minutes, they just figured it out. But imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, John and Mary. Mary has the right answer because she understands it. John does not because he does not yet understand it. On average, I'm not claiming that it always works that way, but on average, Mary is more likely to go with John than the other way around, simply to the force of logic. But the really important point is Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago, he cannot even understand why somebody doesn't understand it. Again, this curse of knowledge. And I think, you know, if I think back of my own education, if I had a question, <coughs> I would often not even bother asking the professor because they get an answer right over my head. I'd, after class, I'd ask a friend, hey, do you understand what blah, blah, blah said and what that meant? Um, so this may even resonate with some of your own experiences when you were a student. So when I discovered that, I thought, wow, can I exploit this in the classroom? 
So now what I do is I talk a few minutes and then I ask a question. After I ask the question, I give students one or two minutes to think in complete silence. I do not want them to talk to each other. I tell them, if you talk to your neighbor, if I see you talk to your neighbor, I'm going to come to you with a microphone, put the microphone right in your face, and you're going to have to tell the whole class what you were talking to your neighbor. <laughs> No, it's quiet. <laughs> After that, I had them vote on an answer. Before we had the clicker, just to give you the low-tech version, what we did is we had students put their hands on their chest, showing their choice with their fingers. <laughs> One, two, three. As the instructor, I could see sort of the distribution, but as a student, it's still private because you look at the back of the student in front of you. And if you want to reveal the distribution, you have them all raise their hands at the same time. Very simple low tech version. Then, provided somewhere between 30% and 70% have the desired answer, I ask them to talk. Why between 30 and 70%? Well, if there's less than 30%, the right answer is never going to spread, right? <laughs> if there's more than 70%, a lot of students are going to talk to neighbors who have the same desired answer. And you know they're, they're going to run out of things to discuss, and they're going to start talking about the football game or whatever, so they're off task. So that's why uh, that's the optimum percentage. They discuss for one or two minutes, and then I poll them again. And then we wrap up with an explanation, which could either be me explaining it, or I could ask one of the students to volunteer to explain it to the rest of the class. And then the cycle repeats until class time is up. Of course, the learning takes place in that discuss there. That's where the actual learning, where the students are teaching each other. Let me show you a little video of how this works in practice. So we have a rectangular loop that is placed in the I read the question with the students. To, to you, this is not going to be on the test, OK? So you don't have to worry about it. The question is, um, what are the magnetic forces on the four different sides of this loop? I read to make sure that everybody understands the question. And then enter your answers. They think for about one or two minutes, silence, and then they vote. I do not show them the distribution uh, before the discussion. Right? I see it, but they don't. There's agreement clearly here. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. See the aha moment there? Ah. <laughs> Initially, we had sort of an even split. And now we have an absolutely overwhelming majority for choice number two. And they do see the second. I do reveal the second distribution, not the first one. So you saw this aha moment. Ah, it's one of the most rewarding things. When you look in the audience, you see people go, oh, yes. And this inside. Why don't you show the first why don't I show the first distribution? Because typically my questions will have between three and four choices. So that means if you want the right choice to be between 30 and 70 percent, it already is the majority choice beforehand. Often, in this case, it wasn't. There were two equal choices. But I don't want to bias the discussion. Right? You bias the discussion to some degree if you show it. Before. Um, okay, so. What's going on here? One is it's active, right, not passive. It's impossible to sleep through my classes because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, now there's a real two-way flow of information. It's not just from me to the students. There's something coming back. If my students don't understand something, I see it then and there. But we can still do something about it. Lastly, it is continuous formative assessment, right? Imagine you're a student, and on the second try, you're among the 10%, or I don't know how much it was, I didn't pay much attention to the distribution, but with something like 10%, who still gets the wrong answer. You see, wow, 90% of my classmates agree it's B, and I still think it's A. You know, you get feedback on your learning in a non-threatening way. I don't give any credit for questions like this in class, for getting it right or wrong or even for attendance. We can talk about it later, right? I'm a strong opponent to giving points for any questions asked in class like this. 
So, you know, you get to try out your knowledge and you get to feed back on your knowledge. And people have pointed out that in assessment, one of the most important functions of assessment is actually feedback on the learning. Whereas, unfortunately, we put most of the emphasis on the ranking part of, uh, of assessment. But this is a fantastic way of doing continuous formative assessment. And as a student, you get feedback in, in a way that is not threatening and won't affect your, affect your final uh, rate. <coughs> so you want to try it? Yeah. Good. OK. OK. I, uh, I'd ask the people from the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning to distribute this little uh, two paragraphs on thorough expansion. Did you all read that before coming here? No? I'm joking. I see, I see Patricia very nervously just asking around. I'm just joking. <laughs> But you know what that means? That means I'll have to lecture you on this third subject. So, and you know, actually, I'm very grateful for that because if I have one regret about the instruction, that I don't get to lecture in my class anymore, and I really love lecturing. <laughs> okay, so it's thermal expansion. Thermal expansion deals with the fact that hard solids like wood or, or, or metal, or you know, concrete, stone, hard metal. Hard, hard solids, hard things, expand when they get hotter, and then they contract again when they get cold. That expansion is called thermal expansion. And it's very important in, in engineering. For example, if you've ever been on a railroad at low speed, you may have heard this clickety clack sounds of the wheels of the train as they go from one section of the rail to the other, because there are little gaps that are between these sections. And we wonder why are they not just jamming the rails together? That would, you know, get rid of this annoying clickety clack sound. Well, if you do that and the rail expands because it gets hotter, bad things happen, as you can see from this picture. And in fact, you know, two years ago with your laboratory in London, the high speed railroad has to have very little gas. They have a slightly different way of putting rails together. But it got very hot in London, and then the whole high speed rail system had to shut down because this was actually uh, happening. Steel beam buildings. You need to take into account the expansion of the steel in order to maintain structural integrity. If next time you park your car in a big uh, concrete parking garage, like the one across the street here, as you park the car and you walk, look down at the floor and you'll see that every 30 yards there's a gap with rubber in between. For the same reason, the concrete expands when it gets hotter. If you don't have that rubber gap to, to, to absorb that expansion, the structure would uh, you know, crumble and, and there would be all kinds of problems. Now, the reason materials, hard solids, expand is that they're made from atoms. I'm showing nine of them here. And atoms get further away from each other when it gets hot. So this is cold, and that is hot. Cold and hot. That's all there is to it. Now, you, you may wonder, this is not going to be part of the test, okay? but I'm going to tell you anyway. You may wonder, why is it that atoms get further away from each other when it gets hotter? And the reason is that atoms don't sit still. They vibrate. And the energy associated with the vibration is what we call temperature. So at higher temperature, they vibrate over a larger amplitude. It's more energy. So this is cold atoms, and these are hot atoms. Cold atoms, hot atoms. As you vibrate over a larger amplitude, you need more space. So I'd imagine your atoms wouldn't just be sitting there. I mean, you'd be shaking. As you shake over a bigger amplitude, you need more space and you push your neighbors away from each other. And it's not just those nine atoms that I've shown here, of course. It's all the millions and billions of atoms that make up the sun. Questions? I knew I'd get to the so thank you so much for reaffirming that. But you know, I am not going to black out the screen and then ask you, when metals get hotter, they expand because A, atoms get closer together, B, atoms stay the same distance, C, atoms get further away from each other when it gets hotter. Because that would be simply me delivering information to you, and you delivering that same information back to me. 
I want to see if you can take this, this idea of atoms getting further away from each other, all of them, <laughs> and apply this to a different so you better ask me a question. <laughs> Cold and hot. Yes, yes. I don't know what to ask. Ah. I, I, I don't know where my gas is. <coughs> very, that's actually a very good point. We'll get back to that. Yes. Did you really go out now? <laughs> <laughs> it's on YouTube. So <laughs> yes. All solids. It happens in all solids, but to different degrees. So you know. Other substances, though, like liquid. Oh, so other phases, other right? Phases. Because I mean, ice is water, such as just like the water in your glass. Ice is a solid. Water is a liquid. If you take ice, it does exactly the same thing. So as you cool your ice, it it, it, it shrinks in volume. As you heat it up, it expands in volume. Then when you turn it into a liquid strange things happen, especially with ice. We won't talk about that because, as you can see, the ice floats in the water. The water is warmer than the ice, so this is the opposite effect there. So, but we will only talk about solids. So I only talk about solids. What happens with liquids and gases is much more complicated. Yeah. But now the questions are coming. <laughs> yes. Can you give me an application of this in another situation or oh. another context? Yeah, an application on the wall near the coffee machine there is a, is a thermostat, if I see it correctly. So the thermostat works by having two strips of metal, different metals. One is, uh, I don't know, maybe copper, and the other one is another metal. And different metals have what is known as different, we go way beyond what I'm going to ask, but okay, <laughs> have different what we call expansion coefficients, which means that for a one degree increase in temperature, they expand by different fractions. Right? So imagine you have two pieces of metal put together. One expands more than the other. They glue together. What is happening? It's going to bend. Right? So this bending actually makes and breaks an electrical contact that turns the heater or the ventilation system on and off. So that's one practical explanation. Right? Thank you for that question. Got to lecture some more. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. What happens when there's no way to go? Well, let's look at this picture in the background, right? <laughs> Normally, when, there's a, when the red expands, there's a gap. I'm going to exaggerate the gap, right? And when it expands, there is the space to go between the rails, right? If you jam them together, as was done for this railroad here, there's no way to go in the lengthwise direction. So what does the rail do? It buckles. Uh, so what if you box it in in all different directions? These forces between atoms are so incredibly high that it's impossible. You know, the, the stuff around it will break. This is why you have to take it into, into account for structural engineering. So. Cold and hot. You're all going way beyond what I'm going to ask. Something practical that is the other illustration of restorative dentistry. Oh, of what? Restorative dentistry. Restorative dentistry. We are putting one material in. So let me repeat because there's no microphone here. Another, another practical uh, consideration in a sense, and an answer to your question. Uh, in restorative dentistry, you put an implant which could be a tenure? or whatever, or another, or, or, or for filling, it could be whatever kind of material, which is different from the uh, material from which teeth are made. The two materials have different expansion coefficients. You know, you drink your hot coffee, and they expand by different amounts. If, let's say, filling were to expand more than the dental material around it, you've got a problem that you crack the tooth. Okay, cold and hot. Any questions? Cold? No. No? I think we're ready for the question. Good. So let's see. Here's the question. I'm going to turn this on. Good. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. Sorry. That mic is on. 
When the plate is uniformly heated, what happens to the diameter of the hole? Does the diameter of the hole... Chief, five people have already answered. I, I, haven't, even, I haven't even read the question yet. Does the diameter of the hole... Think before you answer, please. 14 people, you see, they're really chomping at the bit here. Does the diameter of the hole increase? Does it stay the same? Or does it decrease? And remember, you're not allowed to talk to your neighbor. If you talk to your neighbor, I will take that microphone and, and ask you to tell everybody. Thirty more seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten. So, if you haven't made up your mind right now, you know, don't panic. There's nothing that depends on the answer. I mean, your salary or whatever, you won't, won't be affected by it. So, just, just make a choice, what you, you know, gut feeling tells you is the most likely answer, and, and press a button. But you have to make a choice, okay? I do want everybody to press a button and make a choice. So, what we're going to do next is that I'm going to ask you to find a neighbor who has a different answer. I have to tell this to my students, too, because you find out that they're very... They're very happy to talk to the neighbor, it's the same. Right? So then you don't learn anything, right? So if you turn to your neighbor on your right, and that neighbor has the same answer as you, you say, thank you very much, and you turn to the person on the left. If that person has the same answer, you get up and you walk around. If I see you just sit there without talking to anybody, I'll come and talk to you. Go ahead.
you are. Hello? Hello? <laughs> you are all fired up. I bet that by now many of you have forgotten that I'm not here <laughs> to talk about metal plates and things. I'm here to talk about education. You see, the answer to this question really doesn't matter. <laughs> given my little lecture, just like I did a moment ago, and then instead of asking you the question, I would have said, let's now apply this to rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it. If we take one of these plates and put it in the oven, and then we turn up the temperature, <laughs> the plate would expand, and the diameter of the hole will... I'm going to keep you a suspense a little longer. <laughs> I mean, you would have not been excited like this. I mean, can't you think of anything more boring than metal plates with circular holes? <laughs> and look at you now. You know, anybody who's had small children or dealt with small children know that they're an incredible source of curiosity, sponges for knowledge, asking why, and this curiosity, you know, this boundless curiosity about the, the world around us. As it goes to elementary school and to middle school, we do a very good job turning off that curiosity. <laughs> the good news is, I've just shown to you how easy it is to turn that curiosity back on, all right, by, rather than telling you about the hole in the play, asking you to, to think about it. Now, before I tell you the answer, let's analyze what happened here, right? I asked you the question, and then you had to make a commitment to press a button. Although the button is unimportant, you could have done this, as I said, with fingers on the chest. And after you made that commitment, I asked you to go to a neighbor, and you had to externalize the answer. And something interesting happened there. I was listening to some conversation, observing people in the back. Everybody moved away from the answer or the fact and started to talk about the reasoning. You feel like how many people have sat there, you know, gesticulating about holes and expansion. So it was no longer the answer that was important, it was the process. So much of assessment actually focuses on the answer. Students get, you know, credit for getting the answer right. Whereas in reality, what is much more important is the process for getting the answer. In a, in a real world problem, the outcome is known. It's how you get to that outcome that is important. Unfortunately, most of our assessment never looks at that. Here, you bring the process back in. In these discussions, you started to think and reason like a scientist. And had it been an art history question, you'd have been talking like, and thinking and interpreting as an art historian. But most important of all, you became emotionally invested in the learning process. If I were to tell you now, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's 10 o'clock, I gotta go. You know, and walk out, you'd come running after me asking me what the question is. A hole in a plate, who cares, right? Anyway, before I can reveal the answer, you need to, uh, you need to vote again. So. Uh, even if you have not changed your mind, vote a second time. Indicate what you now believe to be the correct answer. So if you have not changed your mind, you can press the same button you did the first time. But you have to vote again. Is this thing clicking? I don't know. What is happening? It's not here. It's not. Okay, 115 out of 20. Very good. Thank you. Now I have I have some bad news. I have some bad news. Only twenty eight percent of you got the question right the first time. And you know, as I told you, the method doesn't work that well if it's less than thirty percent, so we decided to below that percent. So in some way, you've actually been making a very important statement. 
Because in essence, you've been telling me, Eric, your lecturing sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly the point I wanted to make, so thank you for helping me make that point. But you know, in honesty, you should have done your reading before coming. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see where we stand after the discussion. The correct answer is... Oh, look at the attention. <laughs> Everybody, there's not one person on his cell phone texting or whatever. <laughs> you even stopped tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is, I, I need a drum roll here. <laughs> Number one. Oh. Yeah. So let's see, let's see what the distribution is. And you know, even though only 28% got it right the first time, here we go, you know, the, and the most popular answer went down by 4%, we still don't quite have a majority. But the, the people who got it right, that's the only one that gained. You see that? The others went down. The other was so, that meant that at every table, at every four, there was only one person who got the answer right. I, I can see many people think, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't want you to lie in bed tonight at 2 a.m. awake thinking, you know, why in the world is this whole thing larger? So let me spend a, a, another precious minute of my time explaining it to you. Imagine you have a jar of jam in a refrigerator. It's one of these jars that, you know, the jar is glass and the lid is metal, one of these ball jars, right? It has a, a, a metal ring and a, and a metal plate. You take it out of the refrigerator. You try to open it, can't open it. What do you do? You run the metal lid under hot water. The metal expands, the ring expands, the hole gets larger. You say, well, you didn't ask us about the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's imagine, let's imagine that we have a plate, no hole in it. We draw a circle on this plate. So now we have a metal plate with a circle. We put the plate with the circle in the oven, turn up the temperature, the plate expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle that we've drawn? It gets bigger. Everything gets bigger, so the circle gets bigger too. You say, that's not fair. There's no hole in it. If there was a hole, then the atoms would expand into the hole. I'll show you what's wrong with that reasoning. Imagine that, ah, uh, I think it's, it's dry, that we go all outside right now, we form a big circle holding hands. We are the atoms at the edge of the hole. Now we step in towards the center of the hole. What just happened to the distance between us? Uh, <coughs> we got smaller, we got squeezed together, yeah. right? The only way to make the distance between us larger would be to remove a few of us. But atoms don't disappear like that. Or to make the hole larger. You won't forget this. <laughs> okay, back to peer instruction. The first year that I implemented this, the first year that I implemented this, I doubled the pre to post test gain on the course concept inventory, and my students' performance on exams increased, even though I'd done less problem solving in class, showing that better understanding leads to better problem solving. And in years since, by choosing better questions in class, questions that are in this 30 to 70 percent range, I tripled the gain. And this was replicated by at many different institutions in many different disciplines, even from from uh, veterinary medicine to to French drama. So great learnings and also greater retention. As one of my students once said, you can forget fact but you cannot forget understanding. And once you've had this aha moment, you own it. You know it. And even if you forget, you trust yourself to be able to reason through it again. It, it increases your confidence in your thinking skills, which is really what is so important in, uh, in education. So I want to spend a few minutes revisiting what happens in the lecture. And then we'll open up the floor for uh, discussion. What is exactly happening in the discussion? 
in a, in a lecture, pardon me. In a lecture, <coughs> you don't really have an opportunity to think. And therefore, it's really hard to pay utmost attention. And as I told you, I promised some data from MIT or you know, which I'm going to show now, which actually are from a paper that has nothing to do with education. It has to do with electrodermal sensing. This is a paper that was published by Ross Picard's group at the MIT Media Lab. And she heads what is known as the Effective Computing Group. And her group, there's a great TED talk about it, recently developed a sensor that you can wear around your wrist that is very much like the fitness sensors that you can have, like, you know, jog, whatever it is, and, and, and Fitbit, and so on. The normal fitness sensors, what they measure is maybe skin temperature, and mostly have an accelerometer that measures motion. The electrodermal sensing measures neural activity at the wrist. And it also has an accelerometer so that you can decouple motor neuron activity from other neuron activity. And they show in this paper, that's what most of the paper is about, that if you monitor electrodermal activity here, you get sort of an overall sense of cognitive load on the brain. You can sort of, by subtracting again motor neuron activity, you can get some sense of what is going on in the brain. You can't distinguish between alpha, beta, gamma, delta waves, but you can have sort of an overall electrical activity, sense of the electrical activity in the brain associated with emotions and, and cognitive tasks. And uh, you know, there's a great thing about that because with these sensors, you can just give a person a sensor and then have the person go about his or her normal business, and at the end of the day or week, download the data and analyze. It would be kind of hard to do that with an EEG because you'd be wearing, you know, electrodes on your head and you'd look kind of silly. Maybe that might be okay. But, you know, most people wouldn't. So one figure in this paper, which I'm going to show to you in a second, shows the data collected on an MIT student for an entire week. Here, here's the trace. And you can see there are periods of intense activity and periods of less activity. So this is day one at the bottom, and then day two, day three, day four, all the way to day seven at the top. Starting at four o'clock in the afternoon when the students started wearing the sensor until three o'clock the next day, and then you know, the next trace. They also asked the student to keep track of the activity that the student was involved in. That's the little letters underneath, which you can probably not read. I want to draw your attention to the parts of the trace labeled class. <laughs> <laughs> the trace goes flat. <laughs> Compare that to sleep, the highlighted region. <laughs> sleep is really important because, you know, we have REM sleep and information can transfer from short-term memory to long-term memory. So our brains are very active in bed. But what this shows is that your students, or our students, it's true for me too, our students' brains are more active when they're, they're asleep in their beds than when they are in the classroom. In other words, they're more asleep in the classroom than they are in their own beds. Now, don't look at the screen. Look at me, because the answer to the next question is, is on the screen. So look at me. I'm going to want you to think. There's one human activity that matches class. Don't look at the screen. What would it be? Watching TV. There it is. <laughs> And this, of course, is something that had been known for a long time. Back in the 60s and the 70s, people did EEGs of people sitting in front of the TV and noticed that people went into a meditative state. <laughs> Why? Because there's this continuous stream of information. If you stop thinking, you're no longer processing the information that comes in. There might be emotions, but there's no meaningful cognitive processing of the information. Why would watching TV be different from watching a lecture, live or even online? I said before that the advantage online is that you could possibly pause. But if you look at viewing habits, I looked at data from a number of different, from edX as well as from, uh, from I forgot what it's called, another, it's not a MOOC, but it's a pre-lecture series. 
from the University of Urbana, I forgot the name. But anyway, you can get the data of the viewing habits of the students, and you find that rather than pausing, they speed it up. <laughs> they watch the whole thing at 1.2 or 1.5 by playback speed to get to it faster. So it's very different, actually, from, from reading a book, which is why I'm not a big proponent of MOOCs. I don't think that they will ever do anything very meaningful. But you know, why would this be different? Right? It's the same transfer of information. What's worse? You get out of this lecture thinking you know it. You thought you knew it about the thermal expansion. But in reality, you hadn't even, as somebody mentioned before, <coughs> really had time to think about it or to even be confronted with any, any misconceptions. In fact, you know, there's a beautiful study that was done at Iowa State University in the biology department. And for that, I have to talk about calico cats. Calico cats are these cats that have these fur collars from here, four different fur collars. And the, the fur collar in cats is encoded on the X chromosome. So in order to have four collars, you actually need two X chromosomes. And um, they had a biologist record two short videos with exactly the same content on the genetics of calico cats. In one of the two videos, she delivered dead-like lectures. You know, well, the decor was not dead-like, but you know, standing up straight with confidence, uh, not looking at her notes, always looking straight at the viewer, at the camera, and therefore at the viewer. Ten minutes. Then they had her record the exact same lecture, verbatim. But instead of looking straight at the camera and looking confident, she was slouched over her note, and she read haltingly, and did not have the same confidence. Then. They, uh, so they took a big bio class, split it into one half the class saw the fluent video, and the other half saw the disfluent video. And then they asked the students to predict how they would do on a test of that material. And the students who had seen the fluent video predicted that they would do twice as well as the students who had done the disfluent video. Then they distracted the students for about 10 minutes with a relevant task and immediately tested the students. And you know what? They did exactly the same. And the students who had seen the discipline video actually were closer to the truth than the other. So the lecture may have sounded all clear, but and you know the students may have thought they knew it, but in reality they didn't. In fact, you know, I have this happen to me all the time. Until last year, I organized the applied physics colloquium at Harvard. And you know, if you organize a colloquium, you, you want people to come, right? So. I always get upset at, at, at colleagues who don't come. So I go to this colloquium that organized from famous professor at Stanford. And you know, now after the colloquium, I walk through the hallway of the lab. And there is a colleague who did not show up. We cross paths. He, he asked me, did you go to the colloquium? I said, yeah, I went to the colloquium. How was it? Ah, oh, it was just a brilliant colloquium. I, you know, I want to make my colleague feel bad. <laughs> he says, really? You know, what was it about? <laughs> um, and then, yeah, it sounded all great, but you know, I cannot actually reproduce it, right? I mean, I'm sure we all experience that, right? It sounds clear, but there's not been any time to process the information in a cognitively meaningful way. In part because you've not thought it through and you've not been confronted with any, any misconceptions. So you walk out of these clear lectures in a sense with a false sense of security. But in the end, it's just an illusion, a, a house of cards. So education is not just about transferring information. It's not about students getting to do what we do. We want the next generation of students to solve the problems we cannot solve. I want my students to stand on my shoulders to tackle problems I cannot solve. And in order to do that, I think we must do more than just transferring information and having them regurgitate the information back. And, and I think active participation in the learning process is absolutely essential. It's the only way to, to, uh, to accomplish that. And lastly, let me reiterate what I said before. It's not the, the pedagogy. It's not the pedagogy. It's not the technology. It's the pedagogy. How many people come to me and say, oh, I've adopted your cricket technology. I get furious when I hear that. Because to me, it's not the clicker technology. You know, it's, it's what you do is the clicker. In fact, there are many teachers who will just, you know, in the bio class, just lecture, and then they'll stop and they say, which of the following is not a living being? 
a flower, a rock, a giraffe. The students press two, and then they continue to, to lecture, taking the peer out of peer instruction. So, you know, then no wonder that students don't actually learn any better because they don't get engaged. Yes, they might be pressing a button for a moment, but there's no thinking and no, no arguing. That's one reason it upsets me. The other one is, you know, <laughs> I miss the boat of commercializing these clickers. So, you know. <laughs> anyway, if you're interested, we, we have a social network of peer instruction users, peerinstruction.net, where you can find other people in your geographical area or in your field of discipline or your school who are using peer instruction or are interested in peer instruction so that you can share questions and materials and experiences and so on. So please. Please uh, do join. And if you want a copy of my slides, they're already online at this URL. You don't need to write it down. Just remember my last name, M-A-Z-U-R, and then go to Google and hit this I'm feeling lucky button, and then you'll have a copy of my slides. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, anyway? Yes? So, Eric, two, two closer to eight questions. One is, have you compared the performance of using asynchronous discussions out of class for active learning to this kind of learning? And then the related point of, do you find that the amount of content you can cover per class meeting equivalent changes when you use the in-class learning? So two, two, uh, two questions. Um, the first one deals with sort of a asynchronous implementation of the instruction. I could do this online too. And in fact, in my class, I use it extensively. For the out-of-class component, what I do is I provide my textbook electronically in a social document annotation system. Um, it, it basically, I don't know if I can easily get to it. Uh, it the, the URL for that system is nb, from notabene, dot mit dot edu. It's the, developed by the computer science department at MIT. So you have the book, um, and, and what happens is that as you read the pages, let me see if I have an internet connection here. <coughs> yeah, let me turn this on. Because I can show it then. That's so much better than just, uh, I should still be, come on. Okay, I have a coupon code, right? What was it again? I agree to the terms. SBU. ISP. Oh, ISP. SB. SB 2014. 20, 2014. Oops, 2014. Does it have to be uppercase? No. Okay. Okay. Done. Perfect. Um, so let's go to NB. NB. Let's go to my current course. Unit eight. So here is the uh, here is the chapter. And all the students see that, uh, that chapter. Oh, it's loading. It's still loading. And uh, basically, unfortunately, I see all the combined annotations from all the, from all the sections. So it's kind of overwhelming. But the students are, are grouped in sections of about 20 students. So they don't see as many. But notice that as I scroll over the text, I see these uh, highlights pop up. They're sort of faint outlines. I don't know if you can see. Let me, let me blow this up. Right, so they're faint outlines, and then as you go over it, it becomes a, a, a bigger outline. If I click on that, I can see a thread of discussion on that subject. A student asks a question, right? So over here, are the different polls analogous to blah, 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 and so on. This is a student asking this on the 15th of February at 9.42 p.m. And then another student on the 16th at 2 a.m., so what, six hours later, says, I think you can think of blah, 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 and so on. The next student, answers another day later at 3.58 a.m. Interesting, you get some idea of which students stay up late. I, I never looked at that. <laughs> and then here another student answers a few days later. So they basically have this asynchronous discussion of the text before coming to class, addressing each other's difficulties. So in a sense, this is peer instruction, but not synchronous with students sitting face to face with asynchronous. And certainly, if, 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 you want, if you want to pose a question, you basically drag a highlight like I'm doing here in the figure at the bottom uh, left and it pops open and then I can just type in a problem and I can either share it with the entire class or just make it a personal annotation if I want, but then I'm never gonna re get a reply, of course. And if I'm very anxious to get uh, a reply, I can check this box, reply requested, 
let me blow this up so you can actually see it. You can also post, an, uh, post anonymously if you want. Um, if a, a reply is requested, all of the students see a question has been posted that one of your classmates wants a reply to. I'm going to hit the cancel button because my question doesn't make much sense. So, <laughs> um, so I find that this system works beautifully. Beautiful. It's a fantastic way to get the students engaged in a meaningful way, interpreting the text rather than reading and memorizing in order to answer questions in class. So there you have the asynchronous. Can you disentangle the asynchronous versus the in-class impact? Only because, so the question is, can I disentangle the asynchronous versus the in-class only because I implemented them at different times? But of course, there are many variables, so I, I haven't published anything on it. And we're still we're still testing how to best implement and assess this. So we're not there yet. So now, before I get to your question, the second question, which is a question of uh, which is a very important question, which I I always get coverage. Can you when you do this? What happens to the in class coverage? So I taught my my this this course in two different modalities, right? Standard lecture and then peer structure. When I did the standard lecture, I covered everything in class. What do the students do out of class? I don't know, no idea. Maybe they look at the book, I'm not sure. In the pre-instruction, the coverage is actually not determined by what happens in the class, but by the out-of-class performance. I assigned the same material to the students, but they're responsible for the reading. And oh, I forgot to say one important thing. So the reason this is very useful for me is because before coming to class, I can review these discussions and I can see what unresolved difficulties there are. And then in class, what I do is I take the unresolved difficulties and rather than telling the students, hey, one of you had a question about, let's see, here's, here's one, uh, whether magnetic poles are, are comparable to electrostatic dipoles, and just say yes or no and explain why. No, that's not what I do. I will actually turn that into a question that I ask in class. I bounce the question back to the class as a whole. And I continue the discussion that started online in the classroom, right? That connects the out of class component actually in a meaningful way to the in class uh, component. Let's sidetrack. So the reading, going back to the coverage, is what determines the coverage in the new class. Now, the more important question is, um, is, however, how much is learned? When I taught the class in a traditional way, and I covered everything in class, some students didn't do better than a gorilla would do. Right? So yes, I covered everything, but they learned very little. Then I switched to peer instruction, and I covered much less in class, but the students did much better. So to me, the question is simple. You know, what is it that really matters? Is it what matters how much the instructor covers in front of the class? I'd say no. <coughs> what matters is really how much is uncovered in the brains of the students. And, 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 you know, but the amount of material treated in the course as a whole, the syllabus has not really changed. Sorry, but a good question. Thank you so much for asking that. Yes? When you have someone who's taught, uh, one of your students who's gotten an answer right, talking to one who's gotten it wrong, in that interaction, when the student got it right is trying to convince the student got it wrong, how much of it do you think is a function of they just learned it or they just got the right answer versus in that interaction, the student got it right, gets a better understanding of what in the way of the students who got it wrong. <coughs> in other words, students get hung up at different places and right. in lectures we can't address that. Right. In peer interaction, does more of that come up? Absolutely, absolutely. You see, normally, if, if, if it's the instructor, did everybody hear it, by the way? Should we get a, uh, we should get a, micro, uh, um, a microphone that can be passed along? I don't know, but unfortunately, mute. Maybe we can get somebody to uh, arrange a microphone and then run the microphone on. So th this question really dealt with the interaction between students, who knows it and who doesn't know. And actually, your question triggered a, a very important thought, which I, I failed to point out. Right? 
What happened when you were talking about the hole in the plate is that your neighbor didn't just give a cookie cutter explanation of the hole in the plate, really tried to zoom in on your personal difficulties, or you did the same thing as your neighbor, right? And, and in a sense, it personalizes the instruction because students in pairs get to address each other's individual difficulties rather than the cookie cutter approach that the instructor, uh, instructor uh, gives. And something else important happens there, namely that both parties benefit. You know, when I started doing this, I thought, oh, I get all these big learning games, but am I really, am I really helping the bottom half of the class at the expense of the top half of the class? But much to my surprise, some of the best students were the best, the best students in my class were the biggest advocates of this method. Why? Because we all know who is the person who learns the most in any classroom. The teacher. So in a sense, and I realize that's what you were aiming at, you turn the better student, the one who knows it, into the teacher. And it's by teaching, the act of teaching actually clarifies your thinking in your own mind. Often while explaining it, you solidify your understanding. You, you, you might even have your own aha moment because the person you're talking with is probing you know, the edge of your own knowledge. So it's really a win-win situation. The people who don't understand go from not understanding to understanding. The people who understand go from understanding to being able to teach someone else. Everybody moves up. Yes? Do you allow, do you encourage the students not to sit next to each other all the time? Because our students can fall into ruts. The kid over here is always the smart one. The, the, the one who then is insecure about what it is always is asking that person, how does it end? So if you mix them around, that would change. Right. So how, how do, do I actually arrange the group and the pairing of the students? I tried that one year and students didn't like it. They want to sit next to their friends. And the chances are that here you're sitting next to people from your own department, even though, you know, you're not coming here to talk to your own department. You might benefit more from actually sitting next to people in other departments. But we tend to be like that, and our students are like that, too. Um, so what was a, a system that I'm using now, which is not the clicker, I use learning analytics, which is um, uh, a platform that was developed in my classroom by a colleague of mine and myself and a postdoc of mine, and has now been purchased by Pearson, um, and I think easily accessible, which has two things. One is it gets away from multiple choice questions. So rather than rather than having A, B, C, D. First of all, you use consumer devices. Students can use their smartphones or laptops or tablets or whatever. And in a sense, the software hijacks the device because you know, they're busy answering questions rather than on Facebook. Um, and, and, um, and, and so rather than asking A, B, C, D question, it can ask open-ended text questions and analyze them in a meaningful way. Or you could ask graphical questions. Students can draw vectors or graphs or you could show a piece of art and have them point at parts of the painting to help them in interpreting the painting, and so on. So it's no longer limited to text and, and, and so on. The other thing is that we, uh, it captures a map of the classroom and it knows where the students are seated. So instead of me saying to the students, talk to your neighbor, on the device it will say, talk to Sarah on your left. <laughs> oh, hi, Sarah. Because it pairs the students depending on what it knows about the interaction with the students. So for example, if I talk Sarah to the wrong answer, it's going to try to avoid pairing me with Sarah in the future. It might, it might say, talk to Tom, who's sitting behind you. Uh, and and, and, uh, and it, it basically learns from the interactions. And it also pairs students, depending on the answers they've given, so that you, know, you avoid pairing students with the same answer. Um, so, so, and that actually turns out to work really well. You get much bigger gains by actually controlling the pair. In my current classroom, I no longer teach in an theater classroom, I teach in a studio classroom, and I use team-based learning from uh, team-based learning at org. I don't know if you've ever heard it talk about it. It's certainly something that I, I highly recommend um, uh, looking into. And the idea is to create a social responsibility for learning. In other words, the student is not responsible to the instructor. No, you're responsible to your teammates. And if you've not done your homework, or you've not done your reading, or you not do, don't do your part, 
you're going to feel bad because your team members are not going to be happy. The instructor is the coach, as always. You know, I'm, I'm not judging them. If, if, if you know, I'm not doing my job, then the other members of my team are going to be upset at me, but the instructor, you know, doesn't really care. So it, 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 it's a great way of creating this social responsibility. But that only works well if you control the team formation carefully. So team formation is very important. How could you do that at the beginning of the semester? So what I do at the beginning of the semester, good question. I do, uh, so we have, uh, we use, we have three projects that are month long. In, incidentally, I, I, I wish I could talk about that too at some point. But th th what inspired me to do this new course was a book called Who Owns the Learning by Alan November, who's a consultant for K-12 education. And um, Alan wrote this book, and um, since I know him, he asked his publisher to ask me to write a review of the book. I hate reading education books. I find most of them are not very interesting. So I got the manuscript. I said yes, because you know, I know Alan, and I didn't want to disappoint him. So I put the, the, the manuscript in my briefcase, and for the next three months, I did everything I could to avoid reading the manuscript. It flew with me all across the globe. And, and, and I, I did everything except reading the manuscript. And on one flight, I, both of my iPhone and iPad ran out of batteries, and uh, I read the in-flight magazine. I had nothing to do, so I grabbed the manuscript in desperation, and I read the first sentence of the foreword, and it said, have you ever experienced something that made you rethink the very essence of something you believe to be true? I was hooked. I mean, can't think of a better hope than that. He described something that happened to him in the early 80s. He was a high school teacher in Lexington, Massachusetts, which is an affluent suburb west of Boston. And he was in charge of the computer classroom at Lexington High School, which in those days was a novelty. Okay, PCs were just coming out. On a Sunday morning at 7 a.m., he gets a phone call from the Lexington Police Department. There's been a break in. Will you please come to the school? not very healthy, gets dressed, drives 40 minutes from Marblehead where he lives to Lexington. Gets to the school, none of the windows of the computer classroom were broken. So he goes and parks his car, goes inside. The door of the computer classroom is not forced open. He opens the door, looks inside. All the computers are there. There's just one strange thing. There's a student sitting at one of the computers. Goes over to the student and says, Gary, what are you doing here? And Gary looks up at him and says, I want to learn how to program the computer. And that's when he realized that if somebody wants to learn something, they'll do anything. They'll break the law. <laughs> so how can you create an ownership of learning? So I really thought very hard about that. And the only way I could think is to really make a project that was meaningful to the students that acts like a Trojan horse. <laughs> In other words, you can't do the project without learning the material that, is, that I want them to learn. And I do that in teams. So there are three projects and three team formations. I form a team for the first project, then I break up the team and a new team. So each month in the semester, I do a new team. At the beginning of the year, I give them the FCI so I know who the high performers, the medium performers, and the low performers are. I make teams of five. There's one high performer, one low performer, three medium performers. So I know that there's no team advantage over any other team. And then we give them a minus breaks uh, questionnaire which looks at you know, their personality, whether an introvert or an extrovert, and there's several additional dimensions. Or we give them a learning style survey. We, we run a, a, a number of different psychological surveys to form teams, maximizing the diversity of personalities and or roles that people like to play in a, in a team formation. This way, during one semester, students get to learn to work with very different personalities. And so far, I, I say it's worked really, really well. I think my time is up. Yes. But I will be around all day, including at the reception at the end. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy to uh, continue to interact. I really enjoyed this, and uh, I enjoyed your questions. And, and, and again, you know, you, you had the URL of my website, and which will send my email. So I look forward to continuing to stay in touch. So thank you very much.